C.S. Lewis has been called one of the most creative minds of the 20th century. More than 40 years after his death, Lewis's scholarly works are still used in university classrooms, while his children's books, The Chronicles of Narnia, are loved by families around the world. Books such as Mere Christianity and The Problem of Pain have been life-changing for multiplied thousands who consider Lewis a spiritual mentor and guide. But just who was C.S. Lewis? What events shaped his life? And how did he change from an outspoken opponent of Christianity to one of its most powerful defenders? Join us for The Making of a Mind, The Life of C.S. Lewis on this day of discovery. Perhaps it was the land that first kindled the imagination of a boy. A boy who would one day become a writer of stories about an enchanted land. A land where courageous children confront evil and prevail through the power of a great lion and the deepest magic of all. Perhaps it all began with the land. The geography and the landscape of Ireland are intimately linked in Lewis's imagination, that he comes back to them again and again. The geography of Ireland, and of Ulster in particular, is very intimate. The, the, the hills are manageable. The, the scenery is uh, full of, everywhere you look, there's practically some sort of link to a mythological event. He particularly loved the area in the Mourne Mountains, which we've already talked about. and the area around Donegal with the wildness uh, and the vast expanse of sky and sea and sand. And he also loved the North Coast. Clive Staples Lewis entered this world in Belfast, Northern Ireland on November the 29th, 1898. He and his brother Warren, who was three years older, were born into a family that loved books and ideas. Their father, Albert, a solicitor, read books voraciously, and the house overflowed with volumes ranging from Paradise Lost to E. Nesbitt's children's fantasies. The boy's mother, Flora, held a degree in mathematics from Queen's University, Belfast, an unusual attainment for a woman of her time. Women were only really starting to go to university and being educated then. It was. It, it wasn't a, an everyday thing. Now, everybody goes to university, but degrees aren't worth an awful lot. I mean, those days, for her to have gone to university and get a degree, that was quite an achievement. While Albert devoted himself to his work as an attorney, Flora cared for her two sons, supervised the servants, and took part in the community life of upper-middle-class society. Every Sunday, the family attended St. Mark's Church of Ireland, where Flora's father, the Reverend Thomas Hamilton, had been the first rector. It obviously had a, a big influence on his early upbringing, Christian life. It was a grounding on his, on his um, religious upbringing. Early on, it was evident that C.S. Lewis had a mind of his own. At the age of four, he announced that he did not like the name Clive and wanted to be known as Jaxie. From then on, his family and friends called him Jax, or simply Jack. They had a very contented childhood. Uh, the family moved uh, originally from Dundella Villas, when they were both young, to the bigger house at Little Lee, uh, which on the, that would be situated in East Belfast. And uh, the move to the big house was a definite move also up in the social hierarchy. This was seen as a, an advancement. You were moving from uh, the suburbs to a more affluent area, and this 
class conscious considerations mattered in Belfast as they do elsewhere. This was a great growing city. Uh, they had the shipyards dominating the Belfast skyline, Harland and Wolf, where the Titanic was built, of course, everyone would be aware of that. Basically a thriving industrial centre at the turn of the century. Lewis describes the lying in bed and listening to the clang and uh, hammer of the shipyard. So it's that busy port, um, thriving and the noise and the clatter and the bustle, and uh, very prosperous, very uh, a city on, on the move, as it were. We had a photograph, very poor photograph, of the Titanic going down the lock on our first voyage. Uh, you could certainly hear the shipyards working. Um, the, I mean, even I can remember that. And wartime years, that, that tap, tap, tap of the riveters. From, from Little, little Lee, uh, certainly they'd have heard, heard the, the, the riveting sounds from the, from the shipyard. I mean, Jack had said that in one of his books. Uh, yes, they would have seen the lock too, through the trees, uh, from up, upstairs. But you go away from Little Lee, round a few corners, and up an area called Craigantlet, right into the Hollywood Hills. And he, with his brother Warney, used to take his bicycle and head up into these hills and cycle up in the summertime on holidays, just looking around as guys do and young boys do. And when you go up there, and he describes it in Surprise by Joy, you have a tremendous vista of Northern Ireland. There's a place you can be up there overlooking Hollywood and overlooking East Belfast, where you can see up north, up to the Antrim Hills, the Antrim Plateau, and you can see south right down to the mountains of Mourne and that area. That sort of romantic sense of longing, that sense of feeling for joy, that sense of looking beyond, was starting even when he was really a young child. And there are those who say, and I think they're right, that the geography or the topography of Northern Ireland is part of the geography of Narnia. As young boys, Jack and Warney drew pictures and wrote stories about their own imaginary worlds. Warney called his India, while Jack created Animal Land. Eventually, they merged them into the make-believe world of boxing. When Warney went away to boarding school, Jack missed his brother, but enjoyed the solitude of his space in the attic called the Little End Room. Then the boys would be together again for the school holidays and a month at the sea in Castle Rock with their mother. Albert Lewis, of course, was a uh, Belfast uh, solicitor. Very, very busy schedule, ran his own office in the centre of Belfast. And uh, he viewed these visits to the seaside as a sort of penitential, something that he had to do for the sake of the family. And Albert Lewis was the breadwinner of the family, and that's how he viewed it, this whole Protestant work ethic which was how Belfast was built at that time and how it was part of the, it was part of his mindset. This, the idea of taking a month off to lounge about on a beach was just totally alien to him. It just wouldn't, he couldn't consider it. Plus he was the police court solicitor. So he had, he had work there that had to be carried out and he was reluctant to hand that over to anyone else. But everything changed for the Lewis family when Flora became seriously ill. Little Lee became like a hospital, with doctors and nurses speaking in hushed tones, and Albert often in tears. Flora suffered through two operations for cancer, was better for a time, then died in great pain on August the 23rd, 1908. Warney was 12, and Jack was nine. Of course, with the death of Lewis's mother, things changed, attitudes changed, and well, Jack's life changed then because he was shortly after that, two weeks after his mother's death, he was sent away to boarding school in England. And I mean, it's hard to fathom now what the effect that had on him. Jack and Warney crossed the Irish Sea by ferry on the first leg of their journey to the town of Watford, 30 miles northwest of London. Years later, C.S. Lewis wrote in his autobiography. With my mother's death, all settled happiness, all that was tranquil and reliable, 
disappeared from my life. There was to be much fun, many pleasures, many stabs of joy, but no more of the old security. It was sea and islands now. The great continent had sunk like Atlantis. I think when Flora Lewis died, the boys not only lost their mother, they lost the father in the sense that Albert couldn't cope on his own at that point. Hence the decision to send Jack to boarding school in England. Perhaps he thought that being close to Warney would somehow be the best option at that point. Perhaps he thought he would make a man of him, as it were. I'm not sure, but the decision was certainly catastrophic to a boy at that age. For the next two years, Jack endured the academic monotony and the harsh punishments of Wynyard School under its brutal headmaster, the Reverend Robert Capron. The boys nicknamed the headmaster Oldie and his grown son who assisted him, Wee Wee. Few boys escaped the headmaster's cruelty and all lived in fear of his cane. Warney left Wynyard in 1909 and Jack escaped a year later when the school closed. Shortly afterward, the headmaster was declared insane. During school holidays, Jack and Warney returned home to Belfast. While Albert was away at work, they entertained themselves by reading, walking, and talking as best friends. They also stole their father's cigarettes and smoked them secretly. One civilizing element for the boys was the hospitality and care of their relatives, the Ewart family who lived at the estate of Glenmachan, near Little Lee. Jack was especially fond of their youngest daughters, Kay and Gundred, 10 years older than he. My mother was born Gundred, or Gundreda really, uh, Ewart. Her mother and Lewis's mother, Flora, were cousins. She was about six foot tall, with rich red hair, elegant. Uh, if I quoted Jack Lewis, the most beautiful woman he ever saw, she certainly um, was, was very attractive. And her photographs in her early life are, are very lovely. At the time after Flora had died, my grandmother took, took over uh, looking after him, and, you know, filling in the, the gap of a mother, which really meant that a lot of it was uh, Mum and Kay. Uh, they, they weren't always awfully fond of him. <laughs> I, rem I remember somebody visiting one time and saying, well, what did you think of him? Well, how, how did you think of him? She just came straight out. Oh, he was a cheeky little brat. Cheeky little brat. How could anybody say that about Jack Lewis? But uh, she said, no, he's a cheeky little brat. He was. He was uh, according to what she always told me, he, he was very bumptious, full of himself. And, uh, yeah, cheeky. <laughs> After beginning a term at Campbell College in Belfast, Jack became so ill that Albert brought his son home for rest and recuperation. Lewis savoured his two-month reprieve from school by reading scores of books, mostly fantasy and fairy tales. From there, he entered Sherbrooke Preparatory School in Malvern, England, just up the hill from Warney, who was at Malvern College. At Sherbrooke, Jack found a solid educational setting with capable teachers. But while his academic skill increased, his childhood religious belief began to wane. Through his own intellectual doubts, and the subtle influence of those around him, Lewis experienced what he called a loss of faith, virtue, and simplicity. Of that time, he said simply, I ceased to be a Christian. Lewis had grown up in a Christian home, but he still, um, he had turned away. Um, he was relieved. He thought of God as the great interferer. Um, he didn't want someone to tell him what to do, someone to order his life, he wanted freedom. And when he was able to convince himself that God didn't exist, there was just relief. When Lewis first saw a copy of the book Siegfried and the Twilight of the Gods, with its vivid illustrations, it rekindled his childhood search for what he called joy, the longing for something far beyond happiness or pleasure. Jack's new interest in North mythology led him to the sweeping music of Richard Wagner, which captivated him with a feeling of northernness, far distances, and a world of imagination. Arthur Greaves, a Belfast neighbor, 
share Jack's interest in mythology. Their lifelong friendship and correspondence helped Jack through many dark and discouraging days. During these years, C.S. Lewis occupied two worlds. In one, he worked hard at his studies, excelling in Latin and English, while taking part in school activities. In the other, he escaped to a place of imagination and heroic tales. But part of the continuing reality he and Warney shared was the strained relationship with their father. Jack's relationship with his father was very tense. Uh, having said that, Albert Lewis supported his son financially throughout his studies. And uh, Lewis uh, uh, did appreciate that. And after his father had died, uh, Lewis had said, I think it was to Owen Barfield, that one of these major regrets was that uh, he didn't treat his father better. He resented his father in many ways. He resented the, the domineering aspects of his father and so on. But possibly behind that is the decision is Albert Lewis's decision to send his son away to boarding school at such a young age. I think the letters between father and son are they maintain a certain standard of what is expected in that relationship. But if then if you look at Jack's letters to, for instance, Arthur Greaves or to his brother Warney, I mean, they continually poke fun at Albert and uh, can be quite malicious in many respects. I mean, they call him the potato bird and so on, and the OAB, which is their abbreviated term for the old air balloon. In 1913, Jack won a classical scholarship to Malvern College. Warney enjoyed his years at Malvern and called it a paradise, but Jack quickly became unhappy there. Although he loved the beauty of the school and admired his English teacher, C.S. Lewis couldn't stand the system that valued athletes over scholars and forced everyone to play sports. Lewis suffered from a deformity of his thumbs, clumsiness of the hands, as he called it. He couldn't throw a ball or swing a bat and disliked taking part in games or being required to cheer for those who did. He was appalled at the practice known as fagging that allowed upperclassmen to use the younger boys virtually as slaves to perform menial tasks for them. Often Lewis was called to clean someone's boots during the only time he had for preparation before morning classes. Jack just wanted to read and study and learn. At Malvern College, the Grundy Library became his sanctuary from sports and servitude. Once inside, he could relax and his mind could roam free. After a year, Jack's father agreed that his younger son simply wasn't suited for any public school. Albert sent him to be privately tutored by his own former headmaster, William Kirkpatrick, affectionately known as the Great Knock. C.S. Lewis arrived at Kirkpatrick's home in Great Bookham, Surrey in September 1914, a month after the outbreak of World War I. Warney, already commissioned in the army, was awaiting orders to the Western Front in France. I think we can never get to the bottom of just how much Lewis was influenced by Mr. Kirkpatrick, his tutor, who really taught Lewis to think. Lewis said that when he arrived in Great Bookham in Surrey to begin being tutored by Mr. Kirkpatrick for Oxford, he ventured an opinion about what Surrey looked like. And Mr. Kirkpatrick pointed out that as he'd never been in Surrey before and he didn't know what it was like, he wasn't entitled to an opinion. What Kirkpatrick did for him and to him was to subject him to rigorous criticism about logical processes uh, so that he was not only able to claim any particular point without having to justify it by having a reason for it and in a way the great knock as he was called W.T. Kirkpatrick was the one who strengthened the rationality of Lewis because up to this point of course in, in the early Lewis, the young Lewis he was fascinated by story, he was fascinated by myths, he wrote stories, he lived in, in the world of, of books and imagination. He had this openness to culture, but Kirkpatrick gave it discipline and direction. Each day began with a traditional Irish breakfast of bacon, eggs and soda bread 
prepared by Mrs. Kirkpatrick. Private study and sessions with a great knock followed. They began by reading the Iliad in Greek and ranged through other classics in Latin, Italian, and German. In a letter to Albert Lewis, William Kirkpatrick said of Jack, I never had any pupil who could bear the strain as he can. And as time goes on, he makes it more severe. I admire his perseverance, industry, and determination. As I told you, I have to insist on his stopping work at 11 p.m. Kirkpatrick was very, very important in his development, although Kirkpatrick was someone he also had to recover from, from the faith point of view. Because Kirkpatrick was a skeptic, an unbeliever. He had started out training for the Presbyterian ministry, but he effectively lost uh, his faith. And uh, although he didn't influence Lewis negatively by trying to deprive him of his faith, the kind of precepts intellectually and logically he would have given Lewis would have reinforced him in the faith that he had already lost. Although Lewis had recently been confirmed at St. Mark's Church to please his father, he considered himself an atheist. He wrote to Arthur Greaves, I believe in no religion. There is absolutely no proof for any of them. And from a philosophical standpoint, Christianity is not even the best. All religions, that is, all mythologies, to give them their proper name, are merely man's own invention. Years later, Lewis would say, in reflection, a young man who wishes to remain a sound atheist cannot be too careful of his reading. There are traps everywhere. And Lewis was about to step in one, laid many years before by the Scottish preacher and writer, George MacDonald. C.S. Lewis first began to read George MacDonald when he was a teenager. He was, uh, at that time, studying with Kirkpatrick, the man who had such a huge impact on him in so many ways. And Lewis was on a train platform and always was looking for books and found in every man's edition of Fantasties. Picked it up and he said he had no idea what he was letting himself in for. He began to read and he said he, it wasn't until years later he realized what attracted him. He said it was this, you know, it was the sense of holiness, just um, drifting throughout those books, blowing throughout them, and he was captivated, obviously. And he read and continued to read MacDonald, and this was before he'd become a Christian. And he said that reading that book was like crossing a frontier. He said his 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 imagination had been baptized by reading that book. The rest of me, he said, not unnaturally, took a little bit longer. And so from there, um, MacDonald, as well as other authors, began to have this, this touch on his heart that awakened him to the fact that God did exist and that there was something very compelling and something beautiful. And what he'd always longed for was, in fact, what he was finding was God. At the end of 1916, Jack was accepted into Oxford University. But having reached the age of military service, the war raging in Europe lay between him and the studies he longed to pursue. Lewis said of himself at this time, Christianity was mainly associated for me with ugly architecture, ugly music, and bad poetry. But of course, what mattered most of all was my deep-seated hatred of authority, my monstrous individualism, my lawlessness, no word in my vocabulary expressed deeper hatred than the word interference. But Christianity placed at the center what then seemed to me a transcendental interferer. There was no region, even in the innermost depths of one's soul, which one could surround with a barbed wire fence and guard with a notice, no admittance. And that was what I wanted, some area, however small, of which I could say to all other beings, this is my business, and mine only. Lewis had his own struggles. They were very great. And, and we ought to remember, Lewis often pointed this out. He was not a man who, who just sort of drifted into Christianity when he was a young man and just sort of grew in it. Lewis had resisted the faith for many years. He thought he had decided the matters of the universe and it was more or less settled. 
but God wouldn't leave him alone. In 1916, C.S. Lewis did not consider himself a Christian and had no intention of becoming one. But this was only one chapter in his life and much remained to be written. Within a decade, Lewis would meet a fellow professor named J.R.R. Tolkien. Their friendship and mutual encouragement would lead them to write, among other works, the Chronicles of Narnia and the Lord of the Rings. These lines from Tolkien, unwritten in 1916, would later seem almost prophetic of what lay ahead for 18-year-old C.S. Lewis and many others like him. All that is gold does not glitter. Not all those who wander are lost. The old that is strong does not wither. Deep roots are not reached by the frost. From the ashes a fire shall be woken. A light from the shadows shall spring. Renewed shall be blade that was broken. The crownless again shall be king. Born in Belfast in 1898, Clive Staples Lewis demonstrated his lively imagination and writing skill as a child. He also asserted his independence by announcing that instead of being called Clive, he would be known as Jack. When Jack was nine, the death of his mother cast a dark lingering shadow over life, both for him and his older brother, Warney. After several unhappy terms in English boarding schools, two years of private study under William Kirkpatrick honed Jack's abilities as a logical thinker and debater. But it also deepened his doubts about the existence of God. His excitement at being admitted to Oxford University was tempered by the reality that his academic career would be interrupted and possibly ended by the war. In April 1917, Half of University College had been converted to a hospital for wounded soldiers, and Lewis was one of only eight undergraduates in residence. As an Irishman, Lewis was exempt from being conscripted into the British Army, yet he chose to volunteer. His brother Warney had been serving in France for two years. During Jack's first term, he joined a cadet battalion through the officers' training corps. He also developed a close friendship with Paddy Moore, a fellow Irishman whose mother and sister lived in Oxford. On many weekends, he enjoyed the hospitality of Mrs. Moore's home and developed a great liking for her. Before Jack and Paddy left Oxford, they made a pact to care for the other's parent if only one of them survived the war. Both knew that the odds of their being killed were very high. When 2nd Lieutenant C.S. Lewis reached the trenches of the Western Front, he was barely 19 years old. No one who knew the studious young man could quite picture him in this new situation. Depicting Lewis as an infantry lieutenant uh, is a bit difficult. He's, he's not the kind of person you associate with physical activity or muscular anything. He, he wasn't a sporty type of man. What I get more out of Lewis in the Somerset Light Infantry as he was uh, in 1917, 1918, is how he went through the rigours of the trenches and of that horrible conflict that took place in the northern part of France. So that at that age, which he was, what, 19, he really had to grow up extremely fast and he was plunged into deep danger and suffering and extremity so with virtually no preparation and very little army training and he was also exposed for the first time to the camaraderie and the commonality of the army and dealing with all ranks people from everywhere from all stations in life not just the one class, which is what he would normally have been moving in. Sergeant Ayres, an experienced soldier whom Jack greatly admired, took the young lieutenant under his wing. They were together on April the 15th, 1918, during a German attack, when a British artillery round fell short 
killing Sergeant Ayres and wounding Lewis. When Warney received the news, he commandeered a motorcycle and rode 50 miles to a field hospital where he found his brother recovering and out of danger. Within a few weeks, Jack was sent back to England to convalesce. It brought him face to face with real life and not life in books. And the common man and common sense, if you like, uh, Lewis, despite his great intellect and his vast reading, his knowledge of the classics of English literature, Greek and Latin literature and, and, and world literature and philosophy and so forth, understood ordinary people and the common man. And I guess that is particularly because he got to know them in extremity and was able to relate to them and relate to the common sense of the ordinary person. Jack Lewis made only passing references to his experiences at the front, but the war marked him as it did all whom it touched. In a poem titled French Nocturne, Lewis wrote, the jaws of a sacked village, stark and grim, out on the ridge have swallowed up the sun, and in one angry streak his blood has run to left and right along the horizon dim. What call have I to dream of anything? I am a wolf. Back to the world again, and speech of fellow brutes that once were men. Our throats can bark for slaughter, cannot sing. Thousands of people in Belfast, including Jack's favorite cousins, suffered the tragic consequences of the war. A uh, great many ladies of Kay's uh, mum's age never married. The men had all been killed, who that they might have married. Certainly that was the way with Kay. Um, uh, so the war did impact on them. Uh, but mum worked as a nurse. Uh, Kay was an ambulance driver in France and in England. So they probably saw quite a lot. My mother worked in the army hospitals. She worked in, in London and in a hospital in, um, in France. At, I think it was Rouen. Uh, and certainly that, uh, I think, was quite traumatic at times. I wasn't aware of that until her last few weeks when her mind was rambling a lot and. She was always talking about, oh, look at that man with back off his head, or cover him up, and you know, uh, things like that, which obviously had preyed on her mind all that time, but she never ever talked about it. I, th I, th I think if you see trauma, it, it stays with you forever, doesn't it? Must. You can, you can squash it down, but it's going to come back. During the time Jack spent in hospital and convalescent homes, he kept hoping for a visit from his father. Three months after being wounded, he wrote to his father from London. You know I have some difficulty in talking of the greatest things. It is the fault of our generation and of the English schools. But at least you'll believe that I was never before so eager to cling to every bit of our old home life and to see you. I know I have often been far from what I should, in my relations to you, and have undervalued an affection and a generosity which an experience of other people's parents has shown me in a new light. But please God, I shall do better in the future. Come and see me. I am homesick. That is the long and the short of it. But his father never came. Their relationship continued as it had. Outwardly cordial, but inwardly frustrated and annoyed. Jack used his time in hospital to complete a volume of poetry called Spirits in Bondage, which was accepted for publication. It seemed that his dream of becoming a great poet might be fulfilled. In September 1918, word came that Jack's friend Paddy Moore had been killed in action. Of the five young cadets who had enjoyed Mrs. Moore's hospitality in Oxford, only Lewis was still alive. He had pledged to care for Paddy's mother, 
and he intended to keep his promise. A month after the armistice ended the war, Warney was home for Christmas with his father at Little Lee. Warney's diary for December the 27th records, a red letter day today. We were sitting in the study about 11 o'clock this morning when we saw a cab coming up the avenue. It was Jack's. He had been demobilized, thank God. He's looking pretty fit. We had lunch and then all three went for a walk. It was as if the evil dream of four years had passed away and we were still in the year 1913. The murderous guns had at last been silenced, but the world would never be the same. In January, Jack was back in Oxford pursuing his studies. But there was now an added dimension to his life. He kept up a regular correspondence with Mrs. Moore. And within the year, she and her daughter Maureen had moved to a village near Oxford to be closer to Jack. The beginnings of the relationship are complicated. It has to do with her son, Paddy Moore, and his death in World War I, and then Lewis taking on his household. It was marked by very, very great deception. Lewis is, at this stage, what he called a blaspheming atheist. And he's deceiving Albert. For those years, when Lewis is an undergraduate living with Mrs. Moore, Albert doesn't know that. Poor Albert thinks he's just supporting the latest textbook purchase, and he doesn't realize he's contributing to this household. You know. So this was, this was probably the worst part of Lewis's life. Lewis's relationship with Mrs. Moore, of course, is probably the most controversial relationship that he had. And surprised by joy, he takes one paragraph and basically says, there's one part of my life that I'm not going to talk about, and that's the end of it. In the end, he took seriously that commitment that he made to his friend Patty Moore. As they both went off to war, they promised the other to take care of uh, uh, the survivor's aged parent. Lewis took that seriously, and he cared for Mrs. Moore until in the early 1950s when she died. I think that Mrs. Moore provided Lewis with a stable home life, something that up until that point he had never experienced before. The typical Irish breakfast would be bacon and eggs and uh, soda bread and possibly pancakes. It's always talk, Lewis always talks about Irish soda bread or perhaps wheaten bread and always mugs of tea. Mrs. Moore is, of course, an Irish woman born in County Tyrone, Pomeroy County Tyrone. This is an Irish link. This is a, in every day in your daily life. This is where it matters to you in your home life. Not so much in the realms of your imagination where you go now and again, but this is in your daily life. These are people who come from the same part of the world as you, and you have a natural affinity with them. And I think people tend to overlook that or they dismiss Mrs. Moore as being irrelevant and so on. But at the end of the day, Lewis, uh, Lewis chose to live with Mrs. Moore. As a student, Lewis achieved the remarkable feat of receiving first-class honors in three major areas of study. First, honor mods, Greek and Latin texts. Then greats, classical history and philosophy. And finally, English language and literature. It was the equivalent of graduating summa cum laude while earning three degrees at the same time. In 1925, Lewis was elected a fellow of Magdalen College, Oxford. Jack was delighted, and after 15 years of supporting his son's education, his father was relieved. I'm reluctant to give a negative impression of Albert Lewis because he was a very loving man. I mean, he did love his sons, but in his own particular way, it did, that did not manifest itself in uh, embraces or, uh, as we now look on parenting, but he did provide Jack Lewis with the financial stability to carry out his studies. And without Albert Lewis's help, Jack Lewis would not have gone to Oxford. There's no question of that. He could not have afforded to do it. Albert Lewis picked up the bill again and again for Jack Lewis until he secured his place in Oxford. At Magdalen College, Lewis occupied the rooms provided for him in the new building, built in 1733. 
At the formal evening meal, he took his place at the high table with the other faculty members in the hall. As a young Don, Lewis's life followed a rigorous routine of study, lectures, and tutoring individual students. But he usually found time for a daily stroll along Addison's Walk, a beautiful wooded path running alongside the college. And when time allowed, Lewis was always ready for a swim. Yes, he loved splashing around in the waves. Um, he talks a lot about his um, body surfing in the waves of Donegal on the northwest coast of Ireland. And he, um, he would often go swimming in rivers. He liked to swim without the tiresome convention of bathing trunks. And there's a little um, enclosure on the river in Oxford called Parson's Pleasure, which was enclosed and set aside for for the nude bathers amongst the university dons. They tried to set up a, a female equivalent called Dame's Delight, but the women weren't interested in doing it. <laughs> They've closed it down now, Parsons' pleasure. In September 1929, Lewis's father, Albert, died, just after Jack had spent a month caring for him in Belfast. Lewis cabled the news to Warney, a career officer now stationed in Shanghai. A few days later, Jack wrote to a friend, thank you for your sympathy. I thought I had perhaps got a bit used to people I cared for dying while I was at the front, but it doesn't seem to make much difference. He was such a very strong personality and had been the background of my life for so long that I can hardly believe it's all over. But it was over, and a door to the past had closed behind C.S. Lewis. At the same time, a new pathway into the future was beginning to unfold. In the academic world, Jack's circle of close friends grew to include Hugo Dyson, and J.R.R. Tolkien, respected scholars who met Lewis on his own intellectual ground, yet stood firm in their own Christian belief. J.R.R. Tolkien is one of Lewis's uh, closest friends during his lifetime. They taught together at Oxford. Um, obviously, people are well acquainted with The Lord of the Rings, but there is uh, an interconnection there that is very deep and very real. Um, their friendship was important. Um, for many reasons, not the least of which that uh, Tolkien, as a believer before Lewis came to faith, was one of those who helped Lewis uh, over the hurdles that he needed um, in terms of understanding who Jesus Christ was and being able to receive him. It's interesting, as early as I think 1922, um, a friend of his, Leo Baker, had, had said to him, Lewis, your, your chimney stack is going to turn into a church spire one of these days. Um, so his, his friends could see as early as, as that that he was, he was moving possibly in a Christian direction or back to a Christian position because he had had a faith and he'd abandoned it in his early teens. Um, so his conversion was more like a reconversion um, than, a, than a strict uh, turning from atheism, pure and simple, to Christianity. His first two volumes of published uh, work were volumes of poetry and they were published under the pseudonym Clive Hamilton. The first two volumes indicate that Lewis was very much uh, a person frustrated by his sense of not wanting to believe in a God and yet blaming God for all of the pain and all of the sorrow in his own life and, uh, and what he saw going on in society at that time. God was working at him in ways which I, I think he didn't know. Why should Lewis be an exception? As brilliant as he was, you know, he didn't know everything about himself. For example, I don't think Lewis was ever an atheist. Lewis believes he was an atheist. But if you look at Dimer or Spirits in Bondage and you read some of the poetry there, that's some of the most compelling religious poetry you'll ever read. Now, this is supposedly written by a man who's an atheist. You know, there's this unknown self, which, in my view, the Holy Spirit was pulling out of Lewis, 
and he's writing this poetry, you know. Warren Lewis said that he didn't believe his brother converted, that rather it was like a convalescence from a long mental illness, that coming back to Christianity was more along the lines of recovering his sanity. It took, it took at least three or four years, really, for him to, to turn about completely. He became, first of all, a believer in God, not a believer in Christ. He converted to theism in 1929. That's the famous passage which is quoted in a lot of his books about um, being, being brought in kicking and struggling into the kingdom of God. And Lewis was struggling like a fish in a net, trying to get out, looking, as he said, every way for a chance of escape. Because he knew that God would say, you are now mine. You have to do what I tell you now. Lewis wrote of his experience, amiable agnostics will talk cheerfully about man's search for God. To me, as I then was, they might as well have talked about the mouse's search for the cat. Remember, I had always wanted, above all things, not to be interfered with. I had wanted to call my soul my own. But the reality with which no treaty can be made was upon me. In the Trinity term of 1929, I gave in and admitted that God was God. When he finally knelt, he said he was the most reluctant convert in all of England. It, it, you know, and, and the wonderful thing is, he says, the divine humility that accepted him on those terms. So it was another two years later that he became a Christian. In September 1931, Jack's friends Hugo Dyson and J.R.L. Tolkien came to Magdalen College for dinner and conversation. Along Addison's Walk, they discussed metaphor and myth, then talked far into the night of how every pagan myth foreshadowed the reality revealed in Jesus Christ. Lewis began to think, as he said, here and here only in all time, the myth must have become fact, the word flesh, God, man. This is not a religion, nor a philosophy. It is the summing up and actuality of them all. A week later, he decided. That happened when he was being driven to Whipsnade Zoo one day in his brother's motorcycle sidecar. He set out for the zoo not believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And when he reached the zoo, he said, I did believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Yet the journey had not been uh, spent in any particular thought nor in any great emotion. The whole man had moved, he said. There was nothing of me left over or outside the act. I'd, be I'd become awake, he said. I'd woken up. Well, one commentator says that Lewis had nothing to say up until his conversion. Well, I don't fully agree with that, but there's a certain germ of truth in that. Uh, up until that point, Lewis has been trying to be a, p first of all, he's trying to be a poet, and he's floundering about with that. And then after his conversion, he writes The Pilgrim's Regress. And from then on, he doesn't look back. Uh, th the works just continually flow from his pen. It's not just enough to say that Lewis is a great thinker, or Lewis has got a mind that is awake. Lewis is someone whose mind uh, was transformed by his conversion. So at all these aspects of his personality, which had been, as it were, going through on parallel lines up to then, really came together. It seems to us that he went from being a formidable atheist to a formidable Christian right away, but he didn't. There really are uh, about 10 years that we don't really know very much about. When Lewis was, in one way, God, I think, was preparing him. These are the 30s when um, he was just venturing gradually into Christianity. He wrote a few poems, but during that time, Lewis realized that he would never be a great poet. All the plans that he'd made for himself were coming to nothing. He might not ever do anything really worthwhile. And I think he reached the valley of humiliation that Bunyan wrote about. For you have to just give up everything and realize you don't really have anything to present before God. <laughs>
You know, you may be a tutor in Oxford College, but so what? You're just a teacher still. You haven't really done anything. And I think he was brought down to the absolute bottom so you can say, God is my all, and mean it, and not think, God is my all, but I also have my books to my credit. And when I leave the college, everybody will know who I am. No, it wasn't that way. He had nothing except God. Jesus said, whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Looking back on his journey to faith, C.S. Lewis said, The hardness of God is kinder than the softness of men, and his compulsion is our liberation. Oxford, the city of dreaming spires. For more than 800 years, a place of great wisdom and learning. It was here that C.S. Lewis came as a student, a wounded veteran of World War I, convinced that God did not exist and determined to become a great poet. It was here a few years later that Lewis, the university teacher, moved from atheism to embrace a personal faith in God that altered the course of his life. And something obviously did really happen to him in 1931. He was a different man afterwards. And uh, it seems to me that the, the only way you can account for that change is by some real intervention, some divine intervention, some spiritual power being infused into him or getting hold of him and shaking him by the scruff of the neck and, and turning him around. And, and books just poured from his pen. He was incredibly prodigious in his output. Whenever Lewis came against someone else who wanted to argue, he loved it. But there was also this very gentle man who, when somebody had needs, was ready to give what he had, was ready to reach out. And sometimes the person in need was one of his students. My mother's maiden name was Mary Shelley, and she was a distant descendant of the poet, which was made much of when she won this big scholarship to Oxford in 1930. Oh, she was wild and carefree. She was an atheist. She was um, a terrific reader and very keen on Virginia Woolf and, and ideas of freedom and free love and romanticism and she also loved George MacDonald who was a great link with Lewis but um, she, she impressed him or her teachers said how wonderful she was and he met her on Magdalen Bridge and there was something about that meeting. She was on a horse which persuaded him to take her on as a student. Well she fell in love with a guy who we none of us know who he was, and he was married, and um, she had a wild affair with him. And I mean, they went the whole hog. They went into hotels in Bloomsbury and everything. It was unheard of to have an affair at university. It was all right after you were married, perhaps, but you know, university <laughs> was outrageous. And uh, he dumped her just before her finals. And I think that's why she failed miserably. At, at that time, especially as a woman, that was it. She was ruined, really. C.S. Lewis was extremely upset because she had always been considered his most brilliant student, one who would undoubtedly get a first-class degree. And in the letter he wrote to her, he said, I don't want you to get the idea that you've got a third-class mind because you haven't. She didn't know what to do. She decided to teach. My mother applied for this job at senior school and asked Lewis for a reference. And he wrote her such a good reference 
that she got the job in preference to W.H. Auden, who had also applied. Well, C.S. Lewis was a spiritual mentor to my mother ever since they started corresponding when she was at Dartington. And um, he eventually persuaded her to become a Christian. She found it very hard to come to terms with Christianity because it represented all kinds of things that she couldn't stand, you know, like stuffiness. And once she became a Christian, it did change a lot. Because of his demanding schedule, Lewis spent a great deal of time at Magdalen College. But his real home was the Kilns, a few miles away in the village of Headington. Lewis bought the Kilns in 1930, along with his brother and Mrs. Moore, the, the mother of his dead friend, Paddy. They moved in here together, along with Mrs. Moore's daughter, Maureen, who was effectively a kind of sister figure to Lewis. She was only eight years his junior. And, um, and they were delighted by the place. Warren and, and Jack, in particular, were delighted by the garden. They had about eight acres of land, including a lake and woods, and a large kitchen garden, and a tennis court. Not that they played tennis very much, but they did play croquet and badminton on the front lawn, and, and they really loved the place. Jack and Warney attended Sunday morning service at their parish church in Headington. It was there that an idea came to Jack which would lead to one of his most popular and enduring books. He was uh, sitting in his pew in um, Holy Trinity Church one Sunday at the Holy Communion service when he had suddenly had this idea of, uh, of us under secretary of hell, writing to a junior temple on earth about how to tempt the young man who is becoming a Christian. You want to stop it if you can. What if you can't stop it? Then what do we do to corrupt him? And thus, these wonderful screw tape letters, the first one was written in his head at, you know, Holy Communion service. And when he got home, he wrote it down and then. Uh, uh, about 30 more letters followed that in quick succession and you got one of the most important books that he ever wrote. The screw tape letters first appeared in 1941 as weekly articles in a Church of England newspaper. People who didn't belong to any church began buying the paper just to read the letters in which screw tape always referred to God as the enemy. My dear Wormwood, Never forget that when we are dealing with any pleasure in its healthy and normal and satisfying form, we are in a sense on the enemy's ground. I know we have won many a soul through pleasure. All the same, it is his invention, not ours. He made the pleasures. All our research so far has not enabled us to produce one. About the same time, Lewis was asked by BBC Radio to give a series of broadcast talks during the difficult days of the Second World War. So they asked Lewis if he would like to talk about, say, give a series of four talks on, say, modern literature. He said, not that, that wouldn't suit me, but I will give some talks. But I think it have to be on Christianity. But I think we have to go back because people today don't realize that they are sinners. And um, so before they realize that, they have to have the diagnosis. Millions heard them. And I remember one of Lewis's pupils told me he was in the um, officer's mess. And he said a, uh, the bartender had just uh, started to pour something in a glass and Lewis's voice was going on. And the, he, he was waiting for the drink and the bartender was holding the bottle and the glass but he could put them together because they wanted to hear what Lewis said. So riveting was it. Now, of course, he's already a great writer. And, you know, anyone who's written, you know, you have to write to a deadline or you have to write to length, but not like the demands the BBC had. I mean, you had to hit 10 minutes on the dime. This genius of concision, of pungency, was improved by, by the BBC's demands. 
on, on Lewis. You know, I've, I've heard that Lewis's was the second most recognized voice in England after Churchill for, for a period of time there. And um, these broadcasts are the reason for that. One of the remarkable things about Lewis was that he was a communicator who could reach out to the non-academic world. Uh, he could give very learned lectures, but he could also speak with remarkable freshness to people in other disciplines and from other walks of life in a way that you might not have expected from a deeply learned Oxford don. And that, to my mind, is very remarkable. And those four talks generated such enormous interest for the BBC, they asked him back for a second series, then a third, and then a fourth. And then those four series were brought together as mere Christianity. When school children were evacuated from London and came to live in Oxford, it brought another dimension into the life of C.S. Lewis. He liked children much more than I think he thought that he did. And when he had evacuees during the war staying at the kilns, he got very fond of some of them. Well, I first went to the kilns when I was, I think, about 16. Um, I, I was, it was planned that I was going to be evacuated there. And so I went up to meet Mrs. Moore and be vetted. And apparently that was all right. And uh, so it was arranged that I would go and live with, um, with her and the family. Well, it came as a tremendous shock to discover that Jack Lewis was, was C.S. Lewis, whom I revered, whose books I'd, well, some, I'd, certainly the screw tape letters I'd read and various other bits and pieces of his I'd read. And I think I'd heard him speak and, and uh, he was a hero. And uh, I had no idea that that this man in the house, Jack Lewis, was, was he. And I think I'd been there about two or three weeks when the penny dropped. I saw the books on the, <laughs> on the bookshelves and <laughs> the name Lewis, and eventually I, I clocked it. And I was absolutely, I didn't know where to look, how to speak to him. I was so uh, overawed, really, completely overawed. And it took me about two weeks before I could look him in the face again. <laughs> He was so kind to me. He, he put up with all my infantile, you know. He never made me feel inferior or, um, uh, or unintelligent or that I'd said something stupid, or, which of course I did all the time. Living at the Kilns at the time was um, Jack and Minto, Mrs. Moore, and Warney, Jack's elder brother who'd been in the army, Major Lewis and me. And then in the garden, um, in a hut, Paxford's hut, there was Paxford, and Paxford had been with the family for years and years and years. Well, I had to get up very early, particularly in the summer, because Mrs. Moore was a tremendous, um, uh, she was an autocrat, and things had to be done in a certain way. And uh, her belief was that the chickens must be let out of their roosting house. Um, within half an hour of sunrise. So, and then they had to be put to bed um, half an hour before dark, I think. Yes, because of foxes and things like that. So, for instance, when I went, when I went to see a play at the Playhouse in Oxford, I never saw the third act because I always had to get back to put the chickens to bed. Yes, we, we were an odd, uh, an odd household, really. And one of the members of the household for a time was a boy called Ronnie, who was um, mentally handicapped to some degree, I don't know how much. I, he was probably about 22 or 23, but he couldn't read or write. And uh, Jack used to spend, I think, two evenings a week with him, um, teaching him to, to read, which is um, uh, very typical, very typical of him, uh, in the sense that, without wanting to sound pious, I mean, if there was an opportunity to do good, um, Jack would do it. But he was also travelling all over the country at weekends, going to RAF bases and army bases, giving talks uh, about, mostly about religion. But the train journeys were absolutely appalling. I mean, he would, in those days, a train would just stop if a good stop, if, if an army train had to come through or 
it could take you hours and hours and hours to get anywhere, and it did, and he'd come back pretty tired. And then once a week, the Inklings used to meet. And that was his one evening of real relaxation. The Inklings were a group of Christian friends who gathered round Lewis because Lewis and Tolkien liked to hear written compositions read aloud. And they met every Thursday evening in term time and usually every Tuesday morning in the Bird and Baby Pond. And it was there that Lewis read aloud to his friends, Tolkien, Charles Williams, Major Lewis, and others. He read aloud The Problem of Pain as it was being written, uh, The Screwtape Letters. It was there that Tolkien read The Lord of the Rings, or most of it aloud, during the time it was being written. And you can imagine what it was like. These men, it was a, this was a no holds barred affair. You were expected to say what you thought of this work, and if they didn't like it, they said so. But at least they had good critics and, and, and honest ones as well. In 1940, C.S. Lewis began meeting with a spiritual director, Father Walter Adams, an Anglican priest. He found the discipline of weekly confession at first daunting and then liberating. Lewis wrote to a friend, what a mercy to have another's voice to liberate me from all the endless labyrinths of the solitary conscience. I remember Father Walter Adams. He was a small man and he used to wear a big black cloak. My mother adored him because he was so sweet, you know. And uh, he was the confessor for both C.S. Lewis and my mother until he died in 53, 52, something like that. Lewis found great encouragement from Father Adams and said of him, if ever I have met a holy man, he is one. After um, Father Adams' funeral, we went to Lewis's rooms for a drink and um, some sandwiches, I think. And um, my mother and father were there and Hugo Dyson. And Dyson and Lewis had the most amazing repartee, which was terrific fun to be part of. And it was a wonderful, wonderful time. And I always think when I see the films and plays about C.S. Lewis, that they never portray the fun he was. He was enormous fun. He's an incredibly good conversationist, very witty, of course, and just made you roll about with laughter. And that never came out, in my opinion. <laughs> yeah. Very. During the 1940s, C.S. Lewis went beyond his role as an Oxford tutor to become a person whose voice was known throughout Britain. In addition, his best-selling books carried his words around the world. But undergirding everything was a man who sought above all to please God through his life and his work. It would be very hard for me to, to say much about Jack's spirituality, except that it was, he was totally imbued with it. It was, it was what he was. Um, he didn't make any sort of show of it, but he just was a good man. and. Uh, he made big sacrifices to be a Christian. The final crunch was that he, he had to decide whether Jesus Christ was the person that he said he was or whether he was a charlatan or a liar or totally self-deceived. And uh, it seemed apparent to him in the end that, that he must be speaking the truth. And so then he followed it. What was noticeable was how deep it was how all of his thoughts were transformed by Christ and by grace, and how he saw everything through this prism of Christianity. He tried to write about what he thought God wanted him to write about, and he often talks about uh, trying, trying to listen for, a, for the Spirit's leading or, or 
or praying about his writing so that, so that he did what uh, he was being called to do. Early on in the 30s, in the introduction to me Christianity, he says early on he realized that the one thing he could do was to try to explain Christianity to people who didn't have the abilities or advantages that he had. And he stuck to that. His joy had been fulfilled. He had found God. He knew God. And that transformed him and enabled him to be the man he was to be. So Lewis shows that unless we find God, we cannot be what we should be. And that we find that in God through Christ. And that, to me, is the most important thing. For me, he was a saint and always will be. Not at all what other people would think of as a saint, perhaps. I mean, a great, loud laughing, rowdy Oxford professor, um, liked his beer. But he was a saint, I think. In Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis compares the result of having Christ in our lives to having salt on food. Far from killing the taste of the egg and the tripe and the cabbage, he writes, it actually brings it out. They do not show their real taste till you've added the salt. It is something like that with Christ and us. The more we get what we now call ourselves out of the way, and let him take us over, the more truly we become ourselves. In that sense, our real selves are all waiting for us in him. C.S. Lewis's popularity as an author and speaker brought him a great deal of correspondence. Some people praised him, some denounced him, others sent questions and requests for help. Lewis answered, Every letter he received, usually by return of post, that is, he, he read it in the morning and he answered it right then and sent the reply. And I don't know whether, how a modern author would deal with this, probably ignore it. But he felt that if you write a book like Mere Christianity and you put it in before the public and the public writes to you about it, it's your responsibility to reply because you didn't have to publish that book in the first place. My guess is that he wrote at least, say, 10,000 letters. He sat down after breakfast with the letters and answered them, got them out of the way. It often took two hours of just pushing that rheumatic hand across the paper with that mere pen. Sometimes his brother helped him by typing them. Even so, whether type or handwritten, Lewis still had to make up the words. But then that out of the way, he went on to something else. It's not surprising that Lewis once described the ideal life as one in which a man would have almost no mail and never dread the postman's knock. But it was a letter from an American reader, Joy David Gresham, that dramatically altered Lewis's life. I met Joy Davidman first at Hunter College and we became very close friends. She was younger than I. She impressed me immediately by her beauty. She had the most extraordinary skin. Of course, she was young, but still doe-like, dark brown eyes and uh, a little plump and lovely. She was brilliant, she was a good writer, she published in the school publications. She was very shy, and yet she did things that none of the Hunter girls in those days, I'm speaking of the 30s, uh, would dare to do. She went uh, to Harlem to, uh, I think it was the Apollo, to watch the dancing. She was rumored to have an affair with one of the professors. Uh, we thought that was so sophisticated. I think she was a little arrogant intellectually, and she had a right to be. She was much brighter than 
many of the very bright young women at college. I think she was better read than I at that time. I knew more of Tolstoy and Dostoevsky and so on, but she knew more about the classics, which she loved. And the education we got there was a wonderful education. And then, of course, she went through all these strange stages. She was a communist and an ardent one. And she was a, uh, an atheist and an ardent one. But what she married, a very strange man, William Lindsay Gresham, tall, rugged, handsome man, who wrote a book called Nightmare Alley. In 1946, Joy became a Christian and began reading the books of C.S. Lewis. For a time, her husband Bill seemed to share her newfound faith. But it was a rocky marriage. Then the two boys were born, they were very cute little boys, and she went to London. C.S. Lewis had enjoyed corresponding with Joy Gresham, and in 1952, they met for the first time during her visit to England. Within a year, she had returned with her two sons, David and Douglas, to live in London. As their friendship grew, there was another change in store for C.S. Lewis. After 30 years at Oxford University, he made a career change that surprised everyone, including himself. Lewis's move to Cambridge in, in 54 from Oxford was a, a very big event in his life. It, it changed his daily life in, in so many ways. It changed the way people saw him. It liberated him from so much. And the question, of course, is why the change? And the obvious answer, the, the, the efficient cause, was they offered him a chair. They offered him the chair of medieval and Renaissance English literature, which, we're given to understand, had been created especially for him. Well, Oxford, of course, was appalled by the fact that the, the, the megastar, you know, would, would move. But they hadn't given him a chair. When Lewis left Magdalen College, Oxford, for Magdalen College, Cambridge, it marked a new beginning in his life. He arrived almost by parachute, so to speak. He suddenly appeared in our midst. And um, I sat next to him very often because we were a small company and we dined every night and then from there we went to the combination room where we sat around in a small circle and drank coffee every night. So I got to know him quite well during the years I was at Cambridge. He was, he was a very nice man, kind, uh, faintly alarming, but then that made him rather more attractive in some ways. There was an unpredictable element ab about him. He was quite amazingly learned, not in a browbeating way. He just seemed to have read everything that anybody else could conceivably have read um, and had an amazingly retentive memory. I came in once having read the works of John Calvin found a very striking passage in Calvin and quoted it to Lewis, who said, Ah, John, but do you remember how he goes on? And he then quoted the next four lines, to my astonishment. I first met C.S. Lewis in Cambridge. I was at St. Catherine's College, and uh, he was at Magdalen College. And I went to him um, because he was to be my supervisor as I wrote my thesis on Cornelius Agrippa, and he saw me through most of it. I had two full years with him, going from my college at St. Catharines to his at Magdalen every Wednesday morning during term. I found it hard to sleep on Tuesday nights because I knew what was coming up on Wednesday mornings, and I would attend at his door at exactly half past ten with my gown on, and knock, and I'd hear the gruff voice say, come in, lovely long rooms in Magdalen, go through one, then another, and then we'd sit side by side, and I'd pass over to him the folio, uh, that I was using as my copy text and he would run his fingers along the buckled lines and translate and comment and he'd say to me uh, tell me where I go wrong which meant 
where you've made a mistake in your translation so far, quietly put it right, and I'm not going to embarrass you. And he'd knock out his pipe, put on his gown, and would start at half past ten, and at, when the clock struck quarter to one, he would take off his gown, and that would be my hint to go. He came down every morning to morning prayer in the chapel, sat in his same stall there, and uh, loved going through all the psalms. And I associate certain psalms with him. One particularly is Psalm 36. I can remember his Ulster tone coming through, his rather Oxford tones, when he recited the verse, Thy righteousness standeth like the strong mountains, and thy judgment is like the great deep. He said to me once, uh, it starts, My heart showeth me the wickedness of the ungodly, the psalm. He said, It does indeed, does indeed. He said, It's from my heart that I derive my understanding of that deep wickedness. Lewis spent the weekdays in Cambridge during term time, but every weekend and vacation found him back at the kilns, where he and Warney enjoyed working in their garden. Although they loved the garden, and presumably the house, they didn't keep the house in very good condition. They rather let it go to rack and ruin. His friends called the house the Midden, an old English word meaning dunghill, because it was so smelly and dilapidated. The place was covered in tobacco stains because both brothers smoked cigarettes and pipes. They used to knock out their pipes into the carpets and rub the ash in with their feet. They said it was good for keeping out the moths. Um, his friends joked that the house was kept together with cobwebs and bookshelves. And when Joy Gresham first visited the house in the early 1950s, this was before she married C.S. Lewis, she, she apparently asked, what are all these black drapes up at all the windows? Why are, they, why are they so ugly and dark? And she was told, that's the blackout from the war. And the war had finished about 10 years previously. The, the Lewis brothers just hadn't bothered to take these black drapes down. When Lewis was in Oxford, there was hardly a day when he did not visit Joy. They would take long walks and talk, and their minds met. And of course, it was clear to me that she wanted more than their minds to meet. But she couldn't dare. And in one of the letters, she said, look, I'm, by this time, I think Bill gave her, or she gave Bill a divorce. I'm a divorced Jewish woman. And everyone knows who he is. Impossible. And the letters became more and more about him than about her. In April 1956, Jack and Joy were married in a civil ceremony in Oxford. Jack told only his closest friends, saying it was simply a legal means of allowing Joy and her two sons to remain in Britain after the government refused to renew her permit. They continued to live in different houses. Then I learned that she contracted cancer. And at first it was mild and it metastasized here, metastasized there. And our correspondence stopped for a while. She'd been to the hospital, she'd had this done, that done. And almost as a postscript, she said that Jack and I are married. In March 1957, when it appeared Joy was dying, she and Jack had a Christian marriage ceremony in her hospital room. Then he took her home to the kilns to die. When she got very ill, she invited me to come down to visit them. I came to the kilns in Oxford. Joy was already sleeping in their home in a hospital bed. And every morning or afternoon, an ambulant would come and take her to a hospital for some treatment and return her. And yet, she said to me something so unforgettable. She said, now I know they're right. The poets and the movies, it exists. I knew she talked about love. 
And Jack Lewis was such a typical Englishman. I think he even had a patch on his elbow uh, sleeve. And he had a delicious sense of humor. I knew he was about to say something funny before he said it. His eyes lit up. You know people like that, I think. His eyes lit up, and then there it was. I was delighted by him. But I spent most of the time with Joy. After I left, she rallied. A few months later, in a miraculous reversal, Joy's cancer went into remission. This was true love. They met on intellectual level, they met on spiritual level, which was very important to both. Because of the history that Joyce had of embracing causes and then abandoning them, first communism, then atheism, then Dianetics, then one would tend to think this was part of the pattern, but I doubt it. I doubt it because she was deeply and truly in love with Jack Lewis. And much of their correspondence and conversation had to do with religion, with Christianity. I'm convinced she embraced it wholeheartedly this time. After two years of good health, Joy's cancer returned. She and Jack savored their final months together before she died on July the 13th, 1960. There was only one time there was any small talk. I went in and having been going to him for a year, I think it was, uh, I had the courage to say, uh, I hope the black tie professor doesn't mean anything untoward and he turned to me and said are you married and I said yes I am he said you're a lucky man my wife died last week now let's start no he never showed any grief he never showed any grief and all the emotions were displaced onto the page the cure for everything he used to say is ink and uh, if he could read and he could write he was happy whatever was wrong with him uh, and I think he found it easier to convey his emotional states on the page than face to face. It was in his private journal that C.S. Lewis poured out his pain and later shared it with the world. A Grief Observed wasn't published in his lifetime under his own name. It was only after he died that N.W. Clark was replaced by C.S. Lewis on the title page. I mean, obviously, when Joy died, he was devastated, you know. And there's not an emotional wrong note in all of A Grief Observed, the book Lewis wrote, the diary you know, that he kept when Joy died. A Grief Observed is easily his, his most um, forthrightly emotional book. It's like a yelp, a cry of pain, or prolonged cries of pain, in fact. Cancer and cancer and cancer. My mother, my father, my wife. I wonder who is next in the queue. Where is God? Why is he so present a commander in our time of prosperity and so very absent a help in time of trouble? He's really going through the valley of the shadow in the first few chapters of A Grief Observed. Um, it's, it's a version, you could say, of the book of Job. It's, it's a man confronting the, the realities of suffering and the apparent meaninglessness of suffering. Um, why do we go through these tortures? I have no photograph of her that's any good, but her voice is still vivid. The remembered voice that can turn me at any moment to a whimpering child. It reminds you that this was a, a, a real man with a real heart. He could cry. He could acknowledge the, the deeper and the more sensitive aspects of life. And he could also communicate them unforgettably with his pen. My heart and my body are crying out. 
Come back, come back. But I know that the thing I want is exactly the thing I can never get. The old life, the jokes, the drinks, the arguments, the lovemaking, the tiny heartbreaking commonplace. All that is gone. But by the end of the f fourth chapter of A Grief Observed, he's, he is finding some resolution. Not an easy resolution, not pat answers, not glib, trite um, solutions to, to these problems, but a, a deeper piece. He, he describes it as a, a chuckle in the darkness. There's still darkness, but he's now aware that there's someone with him there in the dark. And was, was that noise a chuckle? Difficult to say. To love at all is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will certainly be wrung and possibly be broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give it to no one and nothing, not even an animal. We shall draw nearer to the love of God, not by attempting to avoid the sufferings inherent in any love, but by accepting them and offering them to him, by throwing away all defensive armor, taking all risks, descending when he so wills into all tribulations. Toward the end of my time with him, he was becoming more and more ill, though he never let that affect his um, teaching of me and didn't show any pain. Um, but he did write to me about it on the 6th of December 1961 from the Kilns, Oxford. The position is that they can't operate on my prostate till they've got my heart and kidneys right. And it begins to look as if they can't get my heart and kidneys right until they operate on my prostate. So we're in what an examinee by a happy slip of the pen called a viscous circle. Still, it is not quite closed. Meanwhile, I have no pain and am neither depressed nor bored. So it's a rather charming letter. Um, and that was true. He had had a number of scares. He had had a um, heart attack. In 1963, he had neglected his health terribly, particularly when he was looking after his wife, who had such pressing problems. And as he said to one of his friends when writing to her, the door was open for me, but as I started through, it was closed in my face. And so God said, not yet, not yet. That was the last time I saw him before his death. It was three months or so before and I sat with him, and he talked quite a lot, quite freely to me, as to an old friend. I, mean, I was immensely honored and touched about uh, the pain of Joy's death and about how he'd come through it. And now he said he couldn't wait. He said he'd been up to the gates of the city already and almost been going to go through them, but he'd come back, and now he was looking forward to the moment when he went through altogether. Um, and I, that whole conversation, there was a kind of freedom and serenity about him, which hadn't been there quite before. I came away deeply moved by it, and I'll never forget it. My mother went to see C.S. Lewis in 63 when he was ill. She went to the hospital several times, I believe. She sat on the end of his bed and drew a portrait of him. And he said to her, you mustn't mind me being like this. My mind is tired. He held my hand, and I think the Brits often communicate, being rather buttoned up people, often by tactile gestures more than anything else. But it, it was a confident and touching handshake. I rang Warney one evening. I'd been watching television, and it was a momentous day because Kennedy was shot. And um, I'd been very, of course, stricken by that. But when all of the broadcast was over, I, I rang Warney to say, well, I'm arriving at such and such a time. And he said, I'm sorry, June. Uh, Jack died half an hour ago. Extraordinary day. <laughs>
he, um, I'm sure, regretted, like others do, that, you know, they won't have a final meeting with somebody you know and love very much. You won't be able to go to this place that you like so much again and see the home you're brought up in. Well, but you go to something far, far better. And if anyone was prepared, really looking forward, pawing the ground to get to the Aslan's country, it was C.S. Lewis. On June the 8th, 1941, during the darkest days of World War II, C.S. Lewis delivered a sermon at the University Church in Oxford. He spoke of the weight of glory, saying, It is written that we shall stand before him, shall appear, shall be inspected. The promise of glory is the promise, almost incredible and only possible by the work of Christ, that some of us, that any of us who really chooses, shall actually survive that examination, shall find approval, shall please God. At present, Lewis said, we are on the outside of the world, the wrong side of the door. We discern the freshness and purity of morning, but they do not make us fresh and pure. We cannot mingle with the splendors we see. But all the leaves of the New Testament are rustling with a rumor that it will not always be so. Someday, God willing, we shall get in. Thank you.